Okay, now I just show you briefly in this particular case we went for the enantioselective synthesis. Now, at the beginning it was a disaster because all the classical systems which were very productive for many Dilsaldo reactions that destroy the azadines because they were Lewis acids and these are Lewis acids uh, didn't like or well no they did like the azadine but they did like it too much and the result was this the catal the catalyst will complex the nitrogen of the azadine so total deactivation but this is electrophilic you still have free azadine they combine and you get all sorts of things that we have, of course we have not analyzed it's just stars what we want to have is a combination of the catalyst with the dienophile and then, of course, you have activation, and that could react with the isodiene. So, possible solutions. We thought we could increase the affinity of the, dieno, of the, of the catalyst by using a dienophile, which can lead to a chelate. So that could be competitive with the complexity of nitrogen. Or to de develop new oxophilic Lewis acid. And that's another talk. It's a long talk because it's totally new chemistry but you can read some of our publication on that we have developed a new class of silicon derived catalysts which are the trialkylsilyl triflimate which are much more powerful than the alkylsilyl triflate much more they are super acid so there's a lot of work there and they are very tolerant for functional groups i won't speak about that here but show you the case of a chelate and it shows you that's a one pot reaction and the one pot reaction first was also a disaster. We had done the reaction that was the publication in 1999. We had already isolated the diene. So we took this diene, we took this, we took the box catalyst, and we got very nice result. Now we don't want that. We don't want to isolate the dienes because they are very sensitive, and especially when they're high boiling point because we have big groups uh, of, uh, let's say, phthalimido groups or whatever these compounds are difficult to handle. So we want the one pot. So we run the one pot reaction and we had the catalyst, we had copper, no reaction. We had more copper, no reaction. We had more and more and more, up to 50%. 50% copper, catalyst. <laughs> so it worked, but no selectivity, of course, because it was a catalyst is by copper. And uh, so we thought, oh my God, that's uh, probably not going to work. Till we thought, well, this is probably due to the impu impurities that you carry, because it's one pot, so you carry all the nitrogen-containing impurities. So we have always been helped by silicon derivatives. So we call our friends, in this case it was trimethylsilyl triflate, and say, well, help us. So we put a little bit of trimethylsilyl triflate, a little bit more, while in some case 40%, 50%. In this particular case, I say excess, but it's not always an excess. Uh, in fact, for each case, we just see, we try to put the minimum. But anyway, it's cheap. So we put it there, and then we add copper after 5% reaction occurred. And here are the result. Not so bad. That's probably one of the best, one of the most efficient asymmetric synthesis of piperidine ring. It's one pot from the ingredients that you see there. Well, transition thin model is the one developed by uh, David Evans and, and Corey and so on. And nothing special in that, except that we have an exoselectivity. Okay? And uh, uh, we have the square planar complex. And of course, the approach here is hindered by the tributyl group here. Just one application shown show here with the cinnabyl. So you see, that's the diene. You have two dienes, in fact, this one and this one. But this one is much more reactive. So same approach with an excess of trimethylsilyl triflate using 
this type of uh, uh, dinophile. Uh, these are the three components. Uh, here, the, the fourth component, the catalyst here. Then you generate this 95% yield, EE 95%. Actually, we don't see the other isomer. It's not always 99, 98%, sometimes it's 93 or something like this. Depends a little bit on the groups. But still, you see, we have all the stereocenters which are controlled in this one step reaction. And then you can cleave that, as I told you, and you generate this compound. It's also 95%. I'm sorry, there is a mistake there. So we don't lose anything uh, in this step here. Okay, that's it. Still unpublished. So, I have shown you synthetic crews to natural product analogs, which are short, practical, and productive. And in this particular case, you see a high increase of molecular complexity in a single operation using simple reactions. This allows also for functional and stereochemical diversities. And of course, in this particular case, it's a very efficient route towards complex pyridine, pyrimidine, piperidine scaffold, which are common substructures in pharmacophores and in natural products. And the production, this method, should be particularly well suited for the production of libraries of pharmacophore-like and natural product-like structure for the discovery of new biological type. So that was the story that I want to show you today. And I, I could conclude by showing what Woodward once wrote about synthesis and a share completely his enthusiasm. There is excitement, adventure, and challenge, and there can be great art in organic synthesis. So this was done in this city of Bordeaux, which is a very nice city. I recommend you to visit if you come to Europe. It has been completely renovated in the last 15 years. It's a jewel of the 18th century because it's very homogeneous with the river in the middle. Of course, the most important building of the city is shown here. That's where the, the work has been done. It's an institute, as I said, which combined uh, chemistry and biology and which was created about 15 years ago. And uh, we have a lot of postdocs, and they work very hard, as you can see here, and uh, <laughs> for the production of natural products of great interest. Mr. Lipinski said that. Yeah, but it's, it's weird because you also said that most of the drugs are natural products or natural products derivatives or analogs. So why? Because the, these two groups are experimental groups. They, they were made based on the drugs that are. Yeah, that's why, I, well, I'm not really a medicinal chemist, but uh, we should always be very careful about the rules. I remember when. You remember the Baldwin's rules? Uh, when he published his paper in ChemCom, everybody started to quote the Baldwin rules. And the only person who didn't want to hear about Baldwin rules was Jack Baldwin. He said, no, it's th there are no rules. Because there are so many parameters that you, you, can, you cannot, it's not black and white in science. And I think this is probably the same with Lipinski rule. But there are many factors which are responsible for the physical properties of a molecule. And of course, it, he has identifies, identified some of the factors, and he has said, well, this is good, this is bad, this is good, this is bad. And everybody said that this is a Lip Lipinski rule. But the natural product is something much more complex. And so there are different parameters which play a role which is easy to, to identify because it's a combination of different factors. This is one of the problems for the exo selectivity in the Dilsardo reaction. There are several parameters which play a role. And we, we try to have rules to say these compounds will give endo, these compounds will give exo. It never worked. Because as soon as you change a group, 
there is another interaction which plays a role. And I think that's probably the... Uh, so, when I put that, it was a little provocative in some way, uh, if uh, there were medicinal chemistry here. But uh, what I want to say is that one should not be... Uh, one shouldn't be too, too, too strict about this. And definitely complexity generate properties which make this compound better for pharmacoviability. But complexity is hated by many medicinal chemists and in particular by industry because they think if it's, if it's complex, it's complicated to make. I hope I convince you that it's not always complicated to make. Sometimes it is, indeed. But one should always look at the power of modern organic synthesis. We don't do synthesis now like we did 50 years ago. And we have more tools. And maybe we have ourselves to worry about this, because, as I said, if you do a synthesis, a beautiful total synthesis in 65 steps, it's beautiful chemistry, it's a fantastic training for the student, but at the end of the day, nobody's going to use it. So, this is a, another approach. I don't say it's better, but it's something else. I agree, but the pharmaceutical industry doesn't I know. No, no. Uh, I, 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 well, the part of this has been supported by the pharmaceutical industry, I should say. But, uh, uh, so they are interested. I am now in discussion with another big group in the United States, and they are interested in that because, because we generate complexity. Young people should have questions, I'm sure. Ah, it's young people, yeah. <laughs> Clever. Yeah, why not? I, I like your so idea about the synthesis for youth. It's a, it's a very interesting point of view. Uh, this contest, synthesis for use, like uh, scalable synthesis, uh, what's your opinion about enabling technologies like flow chemistry? You told me before, as I'm thinking. Oh, well, uh, I think flow, flow chemistry is very important. It's, it's a new technology which is going to be more and more important in the future. But it's technology. Yes. Okay? Technology. Huh? It's technology. But, but that's important, of course. Uh, the, 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 as soon as industry gets involved, and it's already starting now, it will develop fantastically because these people are excellent to develop this kind of thing. You know, they are much better than we are. And uh, so, personally, we leave that to industry. Uh, but uh, uh, it's going to be very important. And maybe we will use that more and more in the lab in the future. It will become part of a standard equipment. But if you make discoveries, if you make new reactions, you don't start with flow chemistry. <laughs> you know, you start with batch. And then after that, you may find useful and maybe better. You may avoid side reaction or whatever by using flow chemistry. But microwave didn't exist when I was a student, but it's useful. You know? But uh, this is another technology which is important. But uh, so my feeling about flow chemistry technology is definitely very important and uh, it will be I think more and more used I think so and for the scale up of course sure 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 but for instance uh, this synthesis you know the in the last part uh, and well I uh, I think I spoke about that in in uh, in uh, Brasilia but uh, we have another project with this company and the, all the starting material. They use the synthesis that we have developed, but they still use batch chemistry. But they produce kilo. But they still use batch chemistry because, uh, when you, well, if you have the equipment to do flow chemistry, I don't know how easy it is to adapt a new synthesis to flow. Maybe there are studies. And these companies, of course, they are called by the the guy say, I want to have 100 grams of this compound as soon as possible, of course, tomorrow. And so there is no time to, to start to. 
So they just take what we have in the notebook and they repeat what we have. But uh, in the future, I think uh, flow will be part of uh, standard equipment and so on. I think so. I think so. It's, yeah, it's a tool. Yeah. Uh, on the question, in terms of the development of new reactions, what do you think uh, we are doing? We are working to develop new reactions or working to develop a new methods for old reactions? What's your opinion? Well, uh, we should solve problems where they are. Good. We should solve problems where they are. The problem is an ethical way. And we should bring new ideas to solve problems. So the first one is to identify the problem. So me too, that's not interesting. But me, you, that would be better. So I want to do it, but I will de do a different way. That's, I told you another saying of Woodworth when I asked him when I left his lab, what is interesting? What would you advise me? Because as a young man, you know, you are, s you are sensitive to fashion, you know? And you say, oh, that's important, because you heard somebody talking about the field and so on. So I want to do the same. And Woodward say, no, that's not important at all. What's important, you identify a problem. Any problem is interesting, it just depends the way you do it. That's what he told me. <laughs> and I think that's important. Yeah, <laughs> I'm still here. Yeah. <laughs> so in the, in the end of your talk, you showed the results when you could have the silicon reflate yeah. uh, as an additive or as a... Uh, no, a catalyst. Yeah. A catalyst. As your system as well. Yeah, it's... No, I think it's the next one. Oh, oh, you mean the triflate? Yeah. Oh, this one. Oh, <coughs> this but it... Pr but, um, we knew it's compatible with the isodiene. So that's why we added that, thinking that if there are nitrogen, but well, probably nitrogen containing side product, which complex the copper. Huh? So we thought, let's put something which will probably react with this nitrogen containing compounds and uh, avoid the complexation with copper. And it works, but you needed to add 50% uh, at least, uh, stoichiometrically. So, but we don't know, uh, we don't know the, the products, you know, because you know, we have four steps, you know, four steps. Uh. When we purify the dyeing, we don't need that. <laughs>